Okay, so thank you for coming. Um, thank you for the invitation. It was very interesting to uh, see the talks that I had the chance to see um, yesterday, actually. Um, and it's really a great honor to be able to speak to the Lenora community. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Coxinels. Coxinels is a tool that we've been developing over the past 10 years or a bit more. Um, the, the goal of Coxinel is to help you update your software automatically. Um, also, you can use it to find bugs. Um, the goal in general is to help deal with really large code bases. So, uh, so, so as I said, our, our interest is the maintenance of large and critical software, uh, code that's written in C. And we have mostly focused on the Linux kernel, but Coxinel is used for other C code. Uh, we don't really know exactly what to actually. It's interesting when you make an open source project, you only find out what people are doing w with it when they complain. So. so to give an idea of what our target is, so here's a lovely p picture of the Paris Metro. You can see the curved walls, the uh, white tiles, and in the middle you can see a monitor. And if you study, it's not terribly visible, but if you study the monitor carefully, you realize that the RATP, the, the people, Metro Authority, they are using Linux. Uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, but on the other hand, what's a little bit sad is that one of the way we realize that they're using Linux is because we, they found a bug in Linux, because the system has crashed and it's not telling us uh, when our next train is coming, it's telling us that on line 457 or something, there's a problem. Uh, so obviously we can't uh, remove all bugs, uh, but the goal in our work is somehow to help people improve the quality of the software and improve the quality of the software even, even as it scales. So uh, you can also think about the sort of lifetime of a software project. So you have some great idea, and you want to see if your great idea is going to work. And so you make some simple implementation that kind of has the basic features, does kind of the right thing, and then you can try it out and see if it works and see if it's fast enough or has all the properties you want and so on. And then maybe you come to a conference like this and you talk to other people about your great idea and you say you have a little implementation, you point them to the web page where it is or whatever, a GitHub or something. And people like your idea and they start using it uh, and so all that seems wonderful. But in some sense, that's where the problem begins. When people start using your code, then they want new features, because it was really a great idea, and every great idea can be even more great. And not only do they want more features, they also find bugs. And then when your software gets really popular, then people start to attack it. Okay, so you've brought on yourself all of these problems. So we would like to help people deal with this in this situation after their software has become popular, it has become bigger and bigger, they have more bugs, they need to evolve it in more ways, they can't, they can't live with that quick and dirty implementation anymore. They have to rethink all of the design decisions to make something that's actually stable and robust and can move forward in the future. And a, a really a side effect of all of this is that as the software gets more mature, as we get all those feature requests, after we fix the bugs and realize that actually our design decisions were not very good and we need to do things in a much better way, uh, the code often gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you think of the case of the Linux kernel, in 1994 it was only a bit over 100,000 lines of code and today it is over 18 million. So the things that you could do when it was 100,000 lines of code, it's, it, the, that was fairly manageable. 18 million lines of code is not fairly manageable for one person to understand. So how can we ensure that the software can continue to be maintained even when it re reaches this enormous size? And even one million lines of code, if you think about a smaller software project, is still quite a lot to um, manage. Uh, so when you think about you have some interface in your software, it's not really designed in a good way. Uh, maybe some way of allocating memory or initializing some structures and so on. Um, in general, it's fairly easy to improve the way the thing is designed. You have a certain finite 
fixed amount of code that you have to think about. Maybe you need to come up with some clever new algorithm, but still it's not going to, it should take you a finite amount of time in order to deal with this problem. So you have some functions, you have some data structures, you might want to make them more efficient, easier to use in a proper manner, make them more robust, um, better adapt them to their usage context, and so on. But then the problem is when you have 18 million lines of code to deal with is that you've changed this interface and now you need to adjust the clients of those interfaces all over those 18 million lines of code. Um, so that's incredibly time consuming and error prone. And then when you make those errors, then you also have 18 million lines of code that you have to fix up. Probably not that many lines of code, but you have to go and search for the places where your interface is being used all over in these 18 million lines of code and fix them up in the right way. So all of this means that developers may feel hesitant to make changes. So they, they see something, they think it could be done in a better way, um, but doing it in the better way means that 500 lines of code in 1,200 or 300 different files are going to have to change. And so then one could think, oh, I don't really want to make all those changes, or I might make all those changes in a bad way, or maybe I'll design things so I only have to make a few of the changes, and then maybe other people take care of it later. Oh. So all of these are somehow not very productive for the evolution of the software. So we can look at some examples. Um, so the first one is init timer. <coughs> so this is a, uh, init timer was a function that was in the Linux kernel basically since the beginning of time. If you want to initialize a timer, uh, there are some extra pieces of information you need to give it. You need to give it a function that describes what should happen when the timer expires, and you need to give it some data on which that function should work. Um, so you could consider that we also need to tell it when to expire, but that's kind of an orthogonal issue. So this is the only pieces of information that we're concerned with. And so the original way to do it was to call init timer on some data structure, and also at some time to initialize some fields in that data structure, the function field and the data field. And so these are basically three operations, and these three operations are completely independent of each other, and people can write them in the order that is illustrated here, or they can write them in some order, other order, or they can put some of those initializations in some other function. There's many different ways we can do it. It's kind of chaotic. It's kind of takes a lot of code, and it's kind of chaotic. Uh, so, some years ago, in 2016, so this is already back in, way back in Linux 2.6, um, a new function was introduced, which is setup timer, which basically just does the same thing. Um, but it has the nice property that we just get this whole problem over with in just one operation. Um, we can just find this, we can find the complete setup process in a more uniform manner. Um, and much later, it was realized that the whole init timer process was a security issue because it required the function field to be remain writable, um, and having function pointers that are writable allows attackers to write them, overwrite them with some other more dangerous information. Uh, so we have basically a fairly simple thing. We have code that looks like this. It's got three lines, and we just want to turn it into one line. Uh, so I made a little graph here which shows how the, to the degree to which this has changed has happened over time. So we see in the, at the left side of the graph, it's when the function was introduced. And so we see the green lines going up and the red lines going down. So people made some efforts to uh, actually use the setup timer function and remove some old init timer functions. Uh, but perhaps uh, people lost some motivation and things kind of stagnated for a while. Actually, more init timers got introduced. And while some setup timers got introduced as well, we still had things going not quite in the right direction. Uh, and then there's kind of a plateau period, and then it's not until Linux 4.0, which was released in uh, around 2015, that there was actually, we can see an effort again toward getting rid of init timers and introducing setup timers. And then at the end in 2017, uh, when this whole security issue was something that started, people started paying attention to, somebody made a major effort to get rid of all those 400 calls to init timer and convert the whole thing to something that was more secure. Um, but basically, we have the issue that um, we have a simple interface. It's somehow not really ideal in some ways. Uh, something new is proposed, and then it takes an enormous amount of time before that new thing 
propagates over the millions of lines of code. And actually, more instances of the unsuitable way get introduced along the way because people maybe copy from bad code or just use the first interface that they stumble across and so on. And so this is one example, but there's, you can see some other examples like this. Uh, there's also the devm functions, uh, which are used for resource management. So in a simple case, there's the kzalloc function, which allocates memory. Uh, the interesting thing about case, uh, allocating memory in a language like C is you have to actually remember to free the memory afterwards. Um, so if you forget to do that, then you'll end up with some memory leaks. It's not very good for a long-running, uh, I don't know, my Linux server, it's been running for a couple years now. Um, so little memory leaks can add up over time. Um, so it was observed that many, there's certain kinds of cases where the memory management is always done in the same way. So if you have a device driver, you often allocate memory and a whole bunch of other resources in the probe function, and those live all the way until you remove the device driver. Uh, so we can exploit that to shift the freeing part out of the specific device driver into the uh, general device layer, and that's where these dev m functions come from. So there's for memory management, there's for all other kinds of resources as well. But again, we see we have a new interface. It solves a problem. It makes the code more robust. It's a good thing. It actually makes the code a lot more simple as well because you can get rid of all those frees. Um, but it took a long time to take off somehow. Um, so here, this graph, I'm showing only uh, certain kinds of structures, certain kind of drivers, the ones that uh, kinds of drivers on which um, the devm functions were used initially when they were first introduced. Um, so that it's kind of a fair comparison over time. And again, we see that all the way from 2008 to version 3.0 in 2011, actually nobody really picked up on these functions at all. Um, lots more KZ alloc uh, uses came into play in these probe functions, and very few dev M functions were used. And then eventually, um, it's kind of the community picked up on them, became aware of the benefit that they could offer, um, and then it goes way up, and the um, use of these KC, the raw allocation functions in these positions in device drivers started going down. Um, but again, we have this problem to get people to uptake things over a really huge code base, and in the case of Linux kernel, also over a really huge number of developers and maintainers. So the third example is the case of, of node put. Uh, so these are of node get and of node put are reference counting functions for device nodes. Um, there's a lot of operations on device nodes in Linux kernel, and having all these gets and puts would be a bit tiresome. And so there were a number of iterators that would find that allow you to iterate over a list of device nodes without actually ever looking at the gets and puts. So the gets and puts get hidden in the iterators. But the problem with that is something that is hidden, then you often forget about something. Uh, forget about it. And the problem is if you jump out of these loops, then um, it, you're not going to put the thing on the iteration where you jump out of it. So before jumping out, then you actually need to have an of node put. Um, so then the question is, we can realize that this is a problem, but how are we going to get the entire kernel fixed up? and how are we going to prevent people from introducing this problem in the future. So this in particular, it's not a simple example of just grepping, because when you grep, you just find, for example, the name of the iterator, but you don't see the go-tos or breaks or returns that are inside the iterator that cause the need for the of node put. And so again, we have a, a similar graph. Um, it takes a long time for the use of the good strategy to take off, and it's only quite recently that the use of the good strategy has outnumbered the number of incorrect uses. So again, as I'm trying to emphasize, we have this problem. We have, different, we have good strategies for doing things. These get introduced into the, into the kernel, um, but it takes a lot of time for those strategies to propagate everywhere. So that's why we propose this tool, Coxenel. Uh, Tox Coxenel is a, is, a, is a language, it's a transformation system uh, for allowing you, the person who knows your code best, to uh, write rules that will allow you to automate these kinds of changes across the entire code base. 
So Coxinel, as I said, is a pattern-based tool for um, matching and transforming C code. We've been working on it for a good amount of time now, actually almost 15 years. Um, it allows code changes to be expressed using patterns that are uh, like the code. Basically, we start with the idea of a patch, and we make it a bit more general, something we call semantic patches. Um, and then you have something that looks like a patch. A patch only is going to work in one place in the code. A semantic patch is going to be able to apply to the entire code base. So the, the goal of our work is to not propose the most accurate uh, program analysis, for example. The goal of our work is to uh, create something that's actually usable by Linux kernel developers, people who are not experts in writing internal subcompilers, writing program analysis systems, and so on. So we want you to be able to work with your code as it is, as you're familiar with it, and describe the changes that are needed. Sorry. Um, so here's a, a small example. Uh, basically, again, we're, are, we're based on patches, and so you have fragments of code, and you put minus in front of codes, fragments of code that you don't like, and plus in front of fragments of code that you would like to replace them with. Uh, something that's very important is that CoxNL is completely independent of the configuration. We have a parser that tries to deal with if defs and macros and so on, just as they are found, we don't run the C preprocessor. And so the transformation that you describe will apply across code for all different architectures. It's not going to be specific to one particular configuration. Uh, so here's an example. Basically, this is a completely artificial example just to show the, the idea. Um, we have a function f, and when it uh, has 0 as its first argument, we've decided we would prefer to call it f0 instead of using the generic f function. Uh, so it always is it's going to have zero as a first argument when we want to do the transformation. The second argument has another argument. We don't really care about what that is. And so we say that that argument should be an arbitrary expression. Uh, so you can have some things, things that are called meta variables, and they might be expressions or statements or identifiers and so on. They're different kinds of pieces of code, and they can match anything of the specified kind. And then you have other parts of the transformation which are actually fixed pieces of code and it's going to match those things exactly. So to see how to use this better, we're going to look at the init timer and setup timer example. So the idea is that you should be able to start with an example of the change and then generalize the change so that it can apply not in just one particular place to one particular driver, for example, but actually to the entire Linux kernel. So here's our example. Uh, this is basically the example we looked at before. And so you can see this has some things that are of interest to us, the init timer, the initialization of the data field, the initialization of the function field. There's some things that are of less interest to us. So in between the init timer and the uh, initialization of the data field, there's an initialization of the expires field. That's not part of the setup timer operation, and so we don't want to do anything with that. And there's also the name of the timer, NS timer, it's not very important. The name of the data value, the name of the function, those are all not very important. So we're going to need to generalize away from them as well. Okay, so the first thing we can do is we can get rid of expires. Uh, so we, we remove the expires and we just replace it by dot, dot, dot. So dot, dot, dot means here's some random sequence of code that we're not very interested in. Uh, just, you know, drift over it and match the other things that are mentioned on either side. So we can do that. Um, then we can abstract away from the timer. It's like uh, some drivers will have NS timer, but some of them will have ABC timer or whatever. We don't really care about the name. What we do care about, though, is... Uh, sorry, there's no pointer. Um, what we do care about is that the timer in the init timer call is going to be the same as the timer in the data initialization and the timer in the function initialization. We also care that the data that we get is going to be going off to the argument of setup timer, and the function argument is also going to go off to the setup timer. So the meta variables are letting us say, I don't care about what this particular thing is, just let it be a random expression, but they also let you make constraints between different pieces of code, these things should be the same. 
and they also help you to construct the new code, we should make the new arguments out of other pieces of information found in the pattern. And then just to be a bit more general, we can, since we had our allowed arbitrary things between init timer and data, we can also allow our arbitrary things between the initial of data and function. That wasn't illustrated by, exa by our example, but we can just kind of think that maybe it would be useful to get more results right away. Okay, so I, I took that rule and I, um, but, and what you're intended to do is take that rule and then run it over your Linux kernel, and then it will update everything, hopefully, in your Linux kernel. You can go off and submit your patches, what it, check that they're correct. Um, I should emphasize that uh, we, we're not ensuring that your result is correct. We let you, we just, the tool is just going to do whatever you tell it to do, and so you have an obligation, even though it's done automatically, to actually check the results. Um, but to just for this example, instead of running it on Linux, a particular version of the Linux kernel, I collected all of the changes that had ever happened over time. Uh, so there are 828 of them. And then I just ran my rule on that to see how much of what had been required over the entire time could be done automatically. So we get 308 of them. Okay, so 308 of them, is, it's quite a lot of work actually. Uh, for a human to go through all the different files, find the places that need to be changed, make the change, and so on. But it still is a bit far from 828. Uh, so we have not completely succeeded. Uh, so now you can, once you've made all those changes, then you can search for some other examples of things that didn't get changed by the rule that was proposed. So here's one example. Uh, we can see it has init timer. But if you go back and look at the rule, the rule says we're going to initialize the data field before the function field, and this example initializes the function field before the data field. So you can see kind of a trade-off here. Um, since we are making our rule be very close to the code, that's very nice because hopefully you're pretty familiar with the code, so you can express the rule in a way that you're familiar with. On the other hand, being close to the code means inheriting some constraints from the code, some things before other things, and so on. So you have, might have to make your rule a little bit more uh, verbose in order to get a more uh, wider coverage. So in this case, we need to make basically another rule that has function before data, or actually we can combine it with the previous rule, so that's the strategy I'm going to take just to illustrate a few more features. Uh, this is the rule we had before, and that what we can do is we can add another option so basically, like in a patch, uh, the column zero is important. So we have minus in some column zeros, plus in some column zeros. And we can also have this parenthesis bar parenthesis thing, and that lets you um, make different options. So we've tried not to deviate too much from the C syntax, but we have to deviate a little bit to make things a little bit more expressive. So here we have two options. One is timer comes before function, and one is function comes before timer. And when you have these, these sequences of options, it's going to look at the first one and do that. If that word works, it just stops there. Otherwise, it moves on and tries the next one. So now we're up to 656 calls, so that's like almost three quarters of the work. Um, again, that would be really a lot of work to do by hand, but it's not quite there at the 828. So we can iterate again, and we can go back and look and see what init timer calls are remaining and why they didn't get matched by our rule. And we can see sometimes they initialize the function in data fields before calling init timer, so those are some more cases that we can throw in. Uh, an interesting thing is that some timers have no data initialization, so in that case we're going to have to find some value to put for setup timer, so we can just put zero. And we also find that Coxnell sometimes times out or takes a really long time to run. Um, and in those cases, what's happening is basically, since we don't know whether the function and data things come before or afterwards, whatever choice we make, we're going to do a lot of searching on code that where we've made the wrong choice. So um, there's a way to improve that as well. And in the end, we end up with six rules. There's only 68 lines, and it covers 808 uh, function calls. Okay, so if we go and look at the remaining ones, actually some functions that call init timer don't initialize the data or the function field at all, and so those cases have to be dealt with by hand, basically. Uh, but basically what we have as approach, it provides um, 
rules that I think are fairly understandable. Maybe it takes some use, time to get used to the notation to be able to produce the rules, but I think the rules should be fairly readable. A uh, nice feature is that the tool is going to be parsing the code for you. Uh, so it's not going to try to update cases where uh, there are other things that have init timer in the name but are not actually init timer calls. There are several examples there. Um, as I mentioned before, it, it's going to work over the entire code base for all architectures, ARM, x86, PowerPC, Spark, whatever, whatever is there. Um, and so it's not, uh, there's the, also tools like CLang, which can help you also in finding bugs and making changes in your code, but those tools are actually running the C preprocessor, and so they're only going to find issues for one particular system. And we have, in general, this iterative development process where you can write a rule, uh, you can check your rule, uh, you can see what goes wrong. If uh, things are going wrong, and you, you might, it, when you see what goes wrong, basically you have two choices. Either you can try to improve your rule. Since your rule is fairly readable, it should be fairly easy to improve the rule. Or you can just give up, and you can say, OK, I have three extra cases I need to cover. I just want to uh, do them by hand. Uh, so it's something, the goal is to be able to help you to do the work you want to do. Um, there are actually some Coxino rules that are in the Linux kernel that have been designed to be really, uh, have as much as possible low rate of false positives, that is doing a low rate of doing the wrong thing, and a low rate of false negatives, that is a low rate of missing things. Uh, but if you want to use the tool just for yourself, then you can just write your rule and iterate over it until it does as much as you want it to do. And then you can just move on with your life. Uh, there's no need for it to be uh, perfect in some sense. So to conclude, I'll talk a little bit about how it has been used in Linux kernel so far. Uh, so up to today, there are over 7,000 commits in the Linux kernel that mention Coxinel in some way. Uh, this graph here is showing how it has been used over time in the different years. You can see in the blue dotted lines, those are the Coxinel developers. It's not very surprising that at the beginning we were the only ones using it. We made a great effort to use it to contribute to the Linux kernel so that people would become aware of it and um, might be interested in trying it themselves. Uh, as I mentioned, in 2008 we made it available in open source and then some people started trying to use it. Um, Basically, you can look at the red and the orange lines, which are kernel maintainers and other kernel developers. Note that we have only, these lines only can include people who have actually said that they use Coxinel. So we've always tried to um, make a good example by saying that we use Coxinel when we do something with Coxinel, but people are free to do whatever they want. Um, so these numbers may be too low. Uh, you can see in 2015, there was some, a big peak there for the red line. Uh, some maintainers picked up some rather challenging, rather pervasive things, several pervasive kind of tasks to do. Um, but then actually we, has, we see the same point, high point in 2019 for the maintainers, even though 2019 is not over yet. Um, so we see in general increasing use of the tool. Uh, we looked at um, how have maintainers, just to reduce the number of patches to look at, how have they actually used it? Have they used it for cleaning up the code or have they used it for fixing bugs? Uh, so there's more for cleaning up the code, a bit less for bug fix, actually. There's a lot of tools now in the Linux kernel that target finding bugs. And so, um, whereas Coxinel is the only tool that actually helps you doing these kind of repetitive transformations. So that's kind of our more um, main focus area. Um, okay, uh, just a few examples. Uh, so the first two we have here are removing unused function argument, removing a redundant data structure. So you can think, well, remo just removing something is not very hard. You just go to find all the uses and just uh, go backspace over them or something. Uh, but still, once you have 11 files you have to visit, or once you have 54 files to, you have to visit, then things get a bit more complicated. Um, and then the third example here I have is for interrupts. Um, the idea, we had interrupt handlers and there was a goal to remove a argument, one of the arguments from all of the interrupt handlers. So this argument was providing a value that could be obtained in some other way. Not very many interrupt handlers were using it, but still it was necessary to go through and look through the definition and see if that value was being used. And if it's being used, then to adjust 
uh, how it's how that value is obtained so that the code could still work. So it affected 188 files, uh, really quite across the entire Linux kernel because interrupts are very important. Um, and the change in each case requires studying the code and actually thinking about it and is quite non-trivial. Uh, and finally, uh, the Coxnell is also used by the zero-day build testing service. So there's a bunch of uh, Coxnell rules, as I mentioned previously, that they're in the Linux kernel. And then every patch that is uh, sent in that is in a tree that's tracked by the zero-day build testing service is checked uh, with respect to these rules. Um, so we see various things. There's, um, if you look at the, there's two options. Sometimes the rules provide patches, so they're going to tell the developer directly how to fix the problem. Sometimes they just provide a message saying perhaps you have a missing lock here, and then the developer has to fix, figure out how to deal with it themselves. If you look at the graph, you see, for example, locks are, missing locks are a very common issue. Um, probably missing freeze and various issues related to API functions and so on. So these are, the, the point I want to make though is these are all issues that are caught before they actually go into the main line. Um, so they're not reflected at all in the numbers that I showed previously. So in conclusion, uh, Coxanel brings automatic uh, matching and transformation to the system software developer. So if you want to do something, uh, you don't have to contact the Coxnell developers and ask them how to do it. You can just do it yourself. Um, the idea is it should be, although we, we like to hear from you. So if you do try it and you do run into some difficulties, please contact us. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we have no idea what, whether people are using it or not if nobody complains. So complaints are good. But still, the idea is that it should empower the person who knows the software best in, to make the changes that are needed in the software in a quick and easy, reliable, and automatic way. Uh, so we feel that the tool has been a success as it's used in over 7,000 commits so far. Uh, in current work, what we're doing is trying to infer these rules automatically. Uh, so when I talked to David before, I insisted that we were not doing machine learning. Um, but we, now we try to do a little bit of machine learning so that you can make some examples instead of having to remember the syntax of Coxinell itself. You can make some examples, cha example changes in the code, then you can infer a rule, and then you can apply the rule to the entire code base and get all of the other calls to those functions updated. Uh, so uh, probably at this point, probably everybody in this room uses some code that has been used, touched by Coxinell in some way. Um, and if you would like to use our tool, you can look at our website. Uh, you can also find it on GitHub. So, thank you. We, we do have time for a question, if there's a question from anyone. You I'll, cut, I'll bring, I'll be down. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, three quick questions. One, uh, Cocinel means ladybug in French. Why, why this name? Uh, Second question, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll ask three of them, yeah, and then you can reply, and it's going to be easier. Um, you mentioned you don't care about spacing in the pattern matching uh, algorithm, but do, do you enforce spacing in the replacement text uh, and indentation, like, you know, indentation of uh, argument uh, for functions and so on? And the last question is, um, how is he is your project to use for my own C project? If I don't want to, say, work on the Linux kernel, is it really easy to just okay. uh, use your tool to refactor my project? OK, thank, thank you. you. Uh, so the first question, why is it called Ladybug? Uh, originally, the original name, name was Tarantula, um, <laughs> which sounded more aggressive somehow. But um, unfortunately, some other project had taken the name Tarantula, and so then we searched for a name of another bug that is, eats other bugs. So it's ladybugs are carnivorous. So that was the choice of the name. It's also kind of cute. I don't know. Um, uh, so the second question is about spacing. Um, so Coxnell, uh, by default, it kind of follows the Linux kernel spacing strategies. It does one thing for indentation. It does try to hunt around in the current function and see what strategy you've been using for indentation. So if you're using one tab, it will use tabs for indentation when it feels like indenting something. 
when, if you've been using four spaces, for example, it will use four spaces. Um, if you want to do some kind of strange thing, like some people like to put spaces after parentheses in an if or something like that, um, there is a rule, there, sorry, there's a command line argument which is simple spacing, and that means that the semantic patch is going to follow the spacing rules that you put in the, in the semantic patch rule itself. So if you have removed, if, if basically if you've added an if, and you put if space parenthesis space x, y, z, parenthesis, space, parenthesis, something like that, then it will do that, it will follow that if you give those command line options. Uh, so it's not perfect, but it hopefully will help you a little bit. And the third question was, you want to use it for some other project. Uh, so the main issue is with parsing with respect to macros, because we don't, we're not uh, running the C preprocessor, and you might be using strange macros in your other project. Um, so there is actually a configuration file that you can use to put some information about the definitions of those macros. And there's also a command line option where you say uh, spatch, parse C, and then the name of your pro the directory that contains your project. It will run through the entire thing. It will complain about everything it wants to complain about. And at the end, it will make a summary of the things it doesn't like. So that's really a place to start. You find the summary of the things it doesn't like. You fix up the things it doesn't like. And initially, it will tell you, like, maybe you've parsed 50% of the tokens in your program. And in the end, hopefully, you'll get around to 90% or something like that. And at that point, you can probably just go on and safely use the tool. So the idea is we don't actually have to be able to parse every single line of code. If we're doing init timer to setup timer, we actually have to parse the functions that contain init timers. The other functions we don't care about. Uh, and so if you write your code in a kind of reasonable way, hopefully your nice functions that are doing the changes that you're interested in are written kind of nicely. And then you have some strange macros that do some strange things. Um, and we're not going to be able to parse them, but since you're not putting init timer calls in those macros, we actually don't care about that very much anyway. Uh, so normally Coxinel, it may find many parse errors when it's working on your code, and normally it doesn't report about any of them. So if you find some part of your code and it's not transformed and you expect it to be transformed, the first thing to do is look and see if there was actually a parse error in that function. But normally it's really not a problem. Right. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. That was really lovely. Okay. So we have a panel now, which uh, Elsie is going to chair on uh, data center workloads. That's about as much as I know. So um, I'll let Elsie come up and introduce everyone. Hello. So today we are here to have a conversation about the convergence of data center workloads and supercomputers, namely what we call sometimes around here HPC. So I'd like to invite on the stage here with me uh, Andrew Young from Sandia National Labs and Alexander Droids from Ricken and Brent Gorda from ARM. Welcome. Thanks. So let's take a minute just to introduce yourselves. Andrew, you want to say something about what, how you use supercomputers and <laughs> sure. why you're here? <laughs> I think I'm double mic at this point, so I'll hand it back. We don't need this okay. one. Um, so yeah, I'm Andrew Young. I work at Sandia National Laboratories, um, and we have a long history of playing with supercomputers. Uh, our most recent uh, machine is Astra, which is an ARM-based uh, system provided by Marvell and HPE. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of very interesting work with that. So. How's that? For Welcome. <laughs> That's great. Alexander. Um, so I work at Riken, and uh, Riken is a large government research lab in Japan. It basically does all sorts of science, runs particle accelerators, etc. And it also uh, operates a um, leadership computing facility. And our next, uh, next machine will be based on ARM uh, chips, actually, on Fujitsu AE64FX. And personally, I sort of do both HPC and AI, like natural language processing models, etc. Welcome. Looking forward to that. Uh, Brent. 
and I'm Brent Gorda. I'm Senior Director for High Performance Computing at ARM. Effectively, I own the HPC business worldwide at ARM, which is a bit of a new role. It's been historically operated out of the research program. I've got a rather long history in high performance computing going back to the mid 80s, so I've been around for a while. Great, well I've got some questions to start, but um, as this is a conversation, I urge you to think about your questions, uh, bring them forward, there'll be someone with a mic that can bring a mic to you, but I'll get things started for now. So uh, let me see, uh, Brent, let's, let me ask you first. What data center workloads do you value in a supercomputer environment and why or do your customers value? What data center workloads? So we, we mentioned this a little bit outside. I want to differentiate the workloads that you consider to be data center, which I consider uh, perhaps Oracle databases or cloud workloads on HPC architectures versus the other way around. So um, I think one interesting data point that came up just recently is the NVIDIA acquisition of Mellanox. If you go and listen to the press Q&A session of that, the morning that it happened, Jensen says the reason that we acquired Mellanox is because we envision data center workloads in the future all running the same application and communicating in a low latency, high bandwidth environment. That to me was super curious. I'd love to have his answer as to what he's talking about because that to me sounds like a traditional HPC application, low latency, high bandwidth, right? That's not generally the workloads that you see there. But so pop the stack, I think the data center workloads that you're gonna see initially taking advantage of HPC architectures the way we generally talk about them are the deep learning systems, right? The ones that need to have a whole lot of flops applied to wide problems with big data. Good. Um, Alexander, would you like to add something? Uh, I would say indeed uh, deep learning is uh, the, the straight answer and other than that, um, if you just look at what, what is the difference between your typical R data center architecture, right, and uh, HPC. Both have lots of CPUs, both have lots of GPUs. The differences in connectivity and uh, a bit in software infrastructure. So clearly we don't see, you know, mobile game backends running on HPC. And the <laughs> those uh, workloads which are becoming, I, I, I wouldn't say it's the workloads that migrate to HPC, that's workloads that are changing in nature, like deep learning, is getting bigger, people starting training on a larger scale, and so like, to accommodate this, both things happen. It's either workloads migrate on more appropriate environments, or environments become more appropriate, like we see more and more you know, cloud uh, settings uh, introduce um, uh, tightly connected islands, you know, infinite band uh, connected racks, etc. Yeah, so we're seeing the convergence of, of uh, yeah, the it's hardware coming architectures from, it's, it's coming from both ends. It, it just, uh, the, the hardware adapts to, to the demands of the uh, like workloads. It should. Okay. It doesn't always. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think, Andrew? Uh, so we have a long history of doing simulation. Uh, this is essentially bulk synchronous parallel workloads, you know, categorized by MPI. But it's quickly become the situation where that, that alone is not enough to complete some of the, the, the work that we have. It's more than just simulation. It's about encompassing that simulation with a wider workflow and ensemble. This could be machine learning uh, tools or data analytics tools to do in situ analysis, analysis of your simulation in real time to detect maybe a bad run or uh, an anomalous event in your simulation before you spend the next 12 hours continuing that computation. Um, there's, there's a lot more that goes into this than just simply running an MPI, you know, uh, bulk synchronous parallel workload. And we're seeing that expand and, and grow substantially. So. so are we seeing also then uh, taking the, the traditional MPI and other workloads that are in HPC and supercomputers and driving those down into traditional ARM servers um, that we're building these supercomputers from? So I, I think the answer there is yes. And the story that I want to bring up comes from, I don't know, 11, 12 years ago. I, I started this event called the Student Cluster Competition at SC in SC07, I think. 
and I was looking around for data sets that I could use for these students to compete on. They were going to build a small cluster on the show floor and run some sort of science applications. Um, I'm a cyclist, and so I immediately thought, I'm going to call up Trek, and I'm going to ask them, what do they do? Because Lance Armstrong was big at the time. They were putting him in a wind tunnel. And I wanted to ask them, do you do any sort of CFD simulations on your frames? And I did manage to get to the developers at Trek, and they said, they, I told them about the event, and the first thing they said is, can we get the resumes of these students? Because we would really like to have the capability to do CFD design on our bicycles, but we're scared. We don't think that we know how to run a cluster. We don't think we know how to run an HPC environment. Right, that was 07, so 12 years ago. Fast forward to today, it's all over the place. They're doing that. The people who design pipes are running these CFD applications. Us old timers think of that as a bulk synchronous, I don't mean to call you an old timer, I'm pointing at myself, <laughs> but we think of that as a simulation application in a bulk synchronous kind of manner, but the end user is just presented with a better interface than we've grown up with command lines, and they get to specify their widget and put it into the environment they want and develop a better widget. And so when we hear about HPC moving out into industry, those are the sorts of stories that come to mind to me. Yeah. Very good points. I, um, are there any problems that we need to solve as a community for data center workloads to truly be a, or successfully be adopted by the supercomputers? Um, let's say Andrew. Yeah, uh, I'm going to quickly point out the software ecosystem, right? What we, what we, the tools we use to run our MPI workloads are totally different than what the rest of the world uses, um, and and that's a good thing and a bad thing. That's sort of a characteristic of the type of workloads, right? Historically, a lot of the data center workloads are about doing, you know, a whole bunch of things concurrently, but that's processing, you know, web requests versus we're taking one problem and decomposing it into itty bitty little pieces and doing those in parallel. Um, I think we're starting to see a convergence of that with a lot of the deep learning frameworks, um, but there's still a lot more work that we need to do in the software ecosystem uh, to, to sort of blend those environments together. MPI is not always very fun uh, to work with, and if you can abstract that or maybe leverage the same tools that MPI has been you know, taking advantage of for the past decade or two, I think, I think there's a lot, a lot of value there. Okay, do uh, you want to go next? Uh, I agree to all, all about software ecosystem and not, not just an abstracting you know, API, but just very basic user experience. Like you launch a job on a supercomputer, you go log into the terminal, there's a black window, you type you know, whatever your scheduler you're using, Slurm PBS. But in Amazon, you have very nice command line interface. You just from your laptop, you spin up 10 instances and the launch whatever my produce job you're doing on the cloud. So that's what we want to see on HPC and it's slowly moving in that direction. So I think the Achilles heel for HPC is our lack of resilience. Our programming model is such that if anything breaks at any time, the whole world comes crashing down. Mm -hmm. I created a company based on that and sold it to Intel because the defensive I.O. you need to do Right, these jobs run for months, and if it's going to crash once a week, you're not going to make any forward progress. So you have to have a considerable amount of defensive I.O. to be able to save state and be able to restore it after that machine crashes. In the model of data center, take Amazon, for example. If you think about Amazon as just selling books, when something crashes there, somebody buying a book goes, oops, i got to restart and try buying that book again. In our world with simulation, the whole world comes down and you lose all the work up to date or all the work from your last checkpoint. That to me is a series, serious Achilles heel, especially at scale where it matters more. Yep. Very good points. I'd also add the other sort of problematic point with HPC is the fact that we still treat everything like a batch. You know, life is a batch in HPC, True. For, for lack of a better uh, saying. <laughs> But uh, we see in the cloud world and a lot of throughout, throughout industry, there's a lot more flexibility that can ha be had with your computation. And I, I think the more we can you know, blend those two ecosystems um, and, and sort of that user perspective and experience, I think the better off both systems, right. both ecosystems will be. Right? This, this is sort of where I was going yesterday with my talk about HPC and the fog, right? You're moving 
the workloads that we consider to be HPC, yes, they're MPI, yes, they're both synchronous, further out towards the edge where response time is much more important, right? Human response times are measured in seconds, right? There's kind of three levels of that, but there's, they're measured in seconds, and you can get that kind of response in that environment by putting sufficient resources out at the edge. I think that's a, that would be a positive direction to go. I'm good. I, so we I'd need like more to... questions. Hmm? We need more questions. <laughs> more questions. So are there any questions now from the audience for now? You guys can't be this nice. It's too early. I heard there was a lot of drinking last night. <laughs> <laughs> Every night. Over there, Carl? Yeah, are the Here. Uh, Here. Um, so, Andrew, in your talk yesterday, you were, you were describing some of the problems that you're having, which are a lot of the problems that we have in the commercial space of dealing with large fleets of machines, trying to understand uh, what's happening with them in terms of power, temperature, all of that fun stuff. Is there a way that the commercial world can better interact with the HPC world? Because we're solving the same problems. It would be great to be able to work together on that. Uh, and I'd love to know your, your takes on how we could do that. I agree. Um, yeah, we probably do solve the same problems in very different ways. Uh, I have not seen a whole lot of you know, open source projects on sort of the RAS daemons that people use, the way the metrics are, are, are pulled together and how, say, you know, Amazon manages their data center, for instance. Th that, that's all proprietary as far as I can tell. Um, I'd like to find a nice open source project where we can sort of share in that space. And, and standards, again, if there's a set of APIs that we can all uh, agree on, whether that's Redfish or some other way to sort of harness some of the metrics that we're getting from individual components of, of these large systems, whether it's a supercomputer or a data center, and figuring out nice you know, ways that we can use the same tools to harness and sort of process that data, and know, you know when my random one node out of 10,000 went out to lunch and why, right? So. That's my, I'd, I'd like to work in the open source sort of arena in that space, and I don't see a whole lot. There's some generic tools, but I think there's a whole lot work, more work that's being done, both in HPC and in this industry, that we should be collaborating on. I'd, I'd like to point out, I've, I've worked both in the public sector at the DOE labs for quite a while, as well as in the private sector, and the answer you just heard to me was, at the labs, we're willing to work with you on any problems that we share, and we're willing to make them open source, we're willing to fund them to, the, to a large degree, and we're willing to be the first beta test user of that sort of thing, so you don't have to put your production infrastructure at risk on this new software. The labs are really good at partnering like that. That's why yesterday I said HPC is a great community to do upstart things with. If you can bring problems to the folks at the labs that you care about, they're likely to be able to either team with you directly or point you at another lab that is investigating that sort of thing. It's very open and engaging. Yeah, we're, we're happy to live on the bleeding edge and have been doing so for a while, right? Absolutely, I would certainly say that with achieving the first uh, ARM-based supercomputer in the top 500 <coughs> list. It's a great achievement. Um, it also points out that you also built the first petascale ARM-based supercomputer. So what's it going to take to get past Petascale to build the very first exascale computer? Um, so, Alexander, I think you have well, plans for one. In, in, in a sense, the machines that we are building will be exascale. It will not be exaflop in terms of FP64 precision, but it will be near exaflop in terms of uh, application performance. And, and anyway, even in terms of you know, lean pack flops, it, it just just a bit away from, from that mark. So I don't think there are any, will be any fundamental challenge in to, to just doubling it up eventually. But yeah, we are we just we, we've been saying all times that this lean you know lean pack marks are not that sensible anymore. There are, you know there are many players who just game game those scores with uh, application performance suffering essentially for the sake of you know, building stunt machines. And we are not interested in that. And, yeah. to, to try to add to that, the DOE specifically defines exascale as producing systems that are 50 times faster than what we had in basically 2012 to 2014. So you know, Titan and Sequoia, the, 10, the couple petaflop range. 
that does not mean the same thing as hitting exactly 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second, right? Uh, I don't actually care, and I don't think anybody who's actually doing good science cares about hitting that, that true exaflop number. It's more about enabling our codes and enabling the science that we're doing uh, at, a, at a whole new scale and capability than we've had before. But that's what exascale is about. So whether that shows up as one exaflop or two exaflops or a quarter exaflop, I don't, I don't think it matters. It's about the, it's about the science getting done. And, and you know, that's a lot of what we were trying to do with, with, with Astra is, yeah, not, we weren't going all the way to exascale, but we wanted to sort of, you know, try to identify what the path was for this sort of architecture. You know, how do we get there? We all, we gotta start with petascale, so. That's right. It's too political to add to that answer. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. There's, there's two buckets, right? There's the buckets of scientists that care about the performance, and then there's the bucket of politicians that care about having that yeah. marquee on their country of hitting nexus scale. Limpack looks really good on, you know, your, your one-line statement to Congress or, exactly. or, you know, in the New York <laughs> Times, but, yep. yeah. So I have an easy question. What does HPC look like in 10 years? Ah, ooh. Good one. Interesting. I think the pendulum, do I get to take the risk and go first? I think the pendulum that I see is swinging back. We've had 10 years of attached processors, and we know that they're difficult to deal with. When you see the Fujitsu architecture, you realize that um, a standard CPU is now becoming as capable as a GPU, and the architectures are gonna converge. But with the, with the slowing down of Moore's Law and Denard scaling, I think what you're gonna see more are chiplets where you've got architecturally specific silicon embedded in a chip so that, for example, if you're doing AI, you can have your AI algorithms not in an FPGA, but in silicon next to your standard processors. And so the 10 year time is really interesting because I spent a bunch of time studying quantum computing and almost went to work at three different quantum companies, but none of them could answer the question whether they would have a viable product before my kid graduates high school in 10 years, which is when I would consider being out of the market. So you're right on the edge of where a quantum computer may exist, um, and to educate everybody here and show my prejudice, if it does exist, it will be a, an attached processor. It won't be a standalone system that does general purpose computing by itself. Yeah, I generally agree with that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, the same thing in a slightly different way, and that is the best answer I've heard for sort of post exascale, whether that's five to 10 years or you know, somewhere in between, is heterogeneity. Um, and, and embracing heterogeneity. And I don't mean putting a GPU on, on all your compute nodes and hey, look, I have a heterogeneous you know, system. No, I mean more the extrapolation of that concept to an extreme level. Um, not, not building a, a system that, or, or building a system that has many, maybe multiple different attached you know, chiplets or accelerators or you know, some you know, non-von Neumann system attached to my my, my traditional CPU, um, but also having a very diverse set of those across the machine, right? Right now, all of our supercomputers that we buy are essentially the same, right? Just take a node architecture and multiply that by 10, 20,000, right? I don't think that's gonna be the reality post exascale. I think we're gonna see really diverse and heterogeneous systems, both intra-node and inter, uh, comp you know, computing resource, um, and that's gonna be really tough to harness. Where, where's the fine line between a single system that you described like that and two systems? One made up of this architecture, one made up of that architecture. Good, good Perhaps question. on the same I, I think I think the, the unifying aspect is gonna either, ha is gonna be IO, whether that's interconnect or storage, right? Because at the end of the day, I'm gonna have one workflow ensemble that's not just my simulation. It's maybe 20 simulations along with, you know, a data analytics component, uh, a visualization component, et cetera, et cetera, and they're all going to use that that little, their own little specialized bits of the, that that hardware. Still with us. So it's still going to we're still going to treat it as one machine, I think, because it's yeah. going to solve one or two or a small subset of very big problems. Is it still going to be Luster? <laughs> Please no. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I agree that post, uh, well, the slowdown of uh, Moore's law will be a driver. Uh, how exactly will it manifest itself? Some emergent architecture probably will be under more pressure to not maintain the sort of backward compatibility and use same architecture. I'm not sure if it will manifest itself as heterogeneity of just entirely, you know, new incompatible architectures. But uh, this is a, one, one of those two, I'd say. So this is the, the ARM business model here is completely critical, right? You can't take an x86 core design and build your own thing around it. You're not going to get to license the x86 ISA. Right here is ARM's opportunity at, at the server side to make a big entrance by licensing to Fujitsu who can then take and add their own amount of I.O., special sauce, HBM, all that sort of stuff. Right now, computer architecture is very sexy again, and it's going to be for the next five years. That's going to balloon up, and in 10 years, you're going to see it filter back down to the important architectures that are mainstream at that point. I hope that ARM is one of the more important ones in there. Obviously, the x86 market is going to react as best they can, and the risk market is going to try to catch up as well and try to do their thing. So I think it's a really cool time to be doing computer architecture again. Very good point. The diversity of the ARM ecosystem is based on uh, having a robust instruction set that allows these custom cores and custom architectural designs to really uh, be create uh, these, these massive supercomputers uh, and possible. The, and the advantage is that the software runs everywhere. Yes. Right? Because it's the same ISA, whatever somebody builds is going to run the base software. You may have to go through and do some optimizations, but at least you're running. Satoshi said, my machine will boot Windows. I don't know why you would want to do that, but it is an interesting statement that it can do that. And that's a big underpinning of, uh, of the convergence we're seeing. Yeah. Um, so we are close to wrapping up. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Well, there we go. Can in the back. This is kind of sideways, but with these giant HPC centers getting orders of magnitude better, is there a use for last generations now a tenth the size so you can actually fit it into a building the size of a house instead of the size of a standard office building. You could argue you see that already, just buying a multi-core or many-core CPU, right? That was the reality a decade ago with, with supercomputers. So um, th there is some, some scaling down or small, or, you know, leveraging sort of the economies of scale. But I don't think my supercomputer that's five years old is going to be useful for something else. I think the, the power to flops ratio is going to be cost prohibitive eventually, especially as we talk about pumping down you know, machines that are 10 to 50 megawatts, right? I was thinking more of using today's or tomorrow's technology to solve the smaller problems that we were solving 10 years ago on a much, with a much smaller and cheaper computer. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I quite answered the question. Is it about a used market or about um, running About a groups? new market for, okay. call it a medium performance computer, not a high performance computer, solving a problem yeah. like CFT right. for a bike frame. Okay, so this is a bit of a hobby horse for me because I've been in HPC so long and everybody talks about how small the HPC market is. It's restrictive and the way to the, the story here is if you take a look at the European Processor Initiative, I mentioned it a bit yesterday, they're building a supercomputer capable of an exascale with an ARM-based processor and a RISC-V accelerator. The way they justify that project on a technical and financial scale, take politics out, on a technical and financial scale is that one of those compute nodes is going to be what they sell to BMW to put into a car. And so the single compute node is a fully capable system rewired for I.O. and resiliency and so on. But you should see, if they're successful, you should see that same technology scale all the way down to one node and be available to the market. 
So, so to try to add to that analogy real quick, we like to think of HPC as Formula One, right? We're, we're going yes. to an extreme here. We're going to try to get around this track as fast as possible. And hope is along the way you develop some technology that becomes applicable, say, to the Ferrari that you can then go buy a couple of years later and then another decade later in my, you know, Toyota, you know, forerunner that I have now, right? So I think some of that trickle down happens and, and we, we want to encourage that. Um, but you really got to go compete at the extreme first. It's happening right now internally where we talk about the SVE instruction as an HPC inspired capability in the ARM architecture. And we're seeing it being coveted by other workloads. And we're seeing it work its way down, down the performance stack into different IP that is available. So I have no inside knowledge, but I would expect that you might get SVE in your cell phone in certain number of years and that for image processing and audio processing, it's going to fly, right? And for AI, especially the recognition piece of that, that it's going to do wonderful because of that AI or that HPC inspired feature. I'd, I'd say the dirty secret of HPC is that the, you know, mo most of the workloads you're running on these large machines don't run on the scale of the whole machine and they could have quite comfortably be running on a smaller one. So there are, there are applications which require you know, full systems, uh, and the full systems are needed to push forward the technologies, which has been said. But if you look at any purpose-built system, for example, just any meteorological center, they just buy the scaled-down machine from Cray that they built, you know, the big one from nation, for National Lab, then they sell a small one for whatever agency. It's exactly what's happening right now. We're getting the hook. Okay. Okay. They brought the heat up here. Yeah, I think you, you are. We're out of time. But it's fascinating. <laughs> We'd like to thank you. So, uh, thank you. Great. 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 Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, go get coffee, go to your meetings. Don't forget the demo at lunchtime. And thank you very much for, for Elsie for chairing that. Yes.